Thank you. Make sure as you're seated that you smile up at God. Let him know that you're a happy son or daughter, right? I mean, it's good to be joyful in the presence of God. All right. Listen, I was going to talk about my new comic book for the sake of time. Those of you that are watching, please go out and get it for your kiddos, grandkids, friends, all that. And uh, people need to learn to laugh, don't they? They really do. All right. Well, let's, um, I don't know where to start, so I'll just start. Let's open up to Mark chapter 10. We'll get some places here. And, oh, there's my glasses. All right. There we go. So I want to talk tonight about what God has been saying about 2022. And as you're looking in your Bibles, I also want to remind you tomorrow, uh, join me at 1 o'clock uh, for Elijah's Dreams with Steve Schultz. It's going to be a great time. And uh, looking forward to just connecting with him and the rest of the people. All right, Mark chapter 10. I want to talk a little bit about what we've been, you know, looking at in Scripture as what we feel like the Lord has been showing us about what we're coming into. Mark chapter 10, verse 46, it says, Then they came to Jericho, and later as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a large crowd of beggar who was blind, named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road, and when he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, notice he began to cry out, and I love his cry, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on, not the world, me. And I feel very strongly, and those of you that are watching, that that's exactly what God is waiting for. It's not that we're trying to be selfish, self-absorbed. It's not that we're trying to take the attention or the glory away from God. There has just been a cry in the heart of humanity. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you're a heathen. People are going through stuff. And God knows that. He understands that. And he's waiting for us. And he's been hearing us crying out with the cry. Watch this of mercy. God have mercy. We don't deserve it, but God's bringing it. And so he cries out, have mercy on me. And many who were standing by there sternly told him, be quiet. No, you know, you always got to watch that. There's always those, or there's always something that will try to oppose your cry. But he didn't stop. He kept crying out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now notice this got Jesus's attention. And it wasn't just because he was crying out or he was shedding tears. You know, the Bible doesn't say any of that because that's not what he was doing. Instead, he was crying out, connecting himself and his faith to the covenant. And he said, son of David, that's what that means. Have mercy on me. Jesus stopped, said, come over here. And as he called him over, the man who was blind, they said unto him, take courage, stand up, which is a word for us in this time. He's calling for you and immediately threw off his cloak. He jumped up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said, watch this. This is the word of what the Lord is asking. This is the question that he's asking us as we head into a new season. What do you want me? Notice me. Notice Jesus is included in our request. Okay? We're not making it about us so that we could exclude God. We don't, we're not trying to get things out of order. We first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added. But what do you want me to do for you? Now, people don't think that God does things for them. We know Hebrews 11 says that God's a rewarder to those that diligently seek him. So God does want to do nice things for you. Otherwise, there would have never been a cross because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for us. Right? But notice what happens. He was specific in the question that Jesus was asking. Hey, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to receive my sight. No, nothing else, nobody else could answer that request but God alone. And he said, he was very specific. Why am I saying that to you? Because as we head in to closing out this year, I really believe that we need to be very specific with God. And it doesn't have to be just one request. It could be many things. That you are really wanting God to do. You are believing. You are expecting. It will take God to do it. Amen? Amen? And notice it wasn't a delayed manifestation. 
How many are tired of delayed manifestations? I want to see the book of Acts. <laughs> Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. It, it wasn't, you know, it was suddenly. Notice immediately, he regained his sight. Was it two days later? It was immediate. How many are ready for some immediate results? And I believe it's connected to the me in the question. In other words, if we will honestly focus on God and, and increase our pursuit of him and then position ourselves for the asking, you're going to see immediate things. Now, I want to go on because here's what I really feel is happening. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 15. There is something that God is moved by. And he's not just moved by need. He's moved by faith, but he's also a God that moves by compassion. And compassion is a very, very powerful thing. And I want to just lay this out for you so that you will, you will see. Because part of what 2022 is about, and I wanted just to hit this real quick as you're going over to Matthew 15. There's going to be four specific things. We're going to talk about this. It'll be 2020 true in 2022. There's going to come a truth that the Lord is going to really push as part of his agenda. He's the spirit of truth. You cannot, as much as you want to, you can try to resist it. You can try to restrain it. But the spirit of truth is greater than any lie that anyone or anything can perpetrate, including the devil himself. So 2020 true is going to be about justice. It'll be about continual exposure. It's going to be about knowledge, God revealing some things, showing us some things. It's also going to be 2020 new. And I really sense, just like blind Bartimaeus, it was a new season. And it came because he focused on Jesus, and he also was specific in his request. He got a new season. It's not just going to be 2020 true. It's going to be 2020 new. But here's the beautiful thing. And we're going to talk about this as we continue on our journey through the end of the year. Is It's also the year... And I was studying on Saturday. I was trying to watch football and study. This probably wasn't a good combination. But I heard the Lord speak to me as I was studying. I just had my Bible open and I was reading through it. And he said, tell the people the king remembers. I said, what? He said, tell the people the king remembers. And I said, Lord, you have a message there. And he said, and tell the people in 2022, I remember. And let me say this, you know, oftentimes we think that God's just ignoring something. But if you will do a, a word study, and those of you that are watching, I challenge you. I'll, I'll bring some of this uh, out to you in scripture. But how many of you ever read that there was a book of remembrance? Or the Lord told them to put a book of remembrance. And it's for a reason. Because it not only positions you, but it activates God. And if you remember, when God remembered the bondage that a nation was in called Israel under an Egyptian socialistic, Marxist, communistic type government, right? The people of Israel, they were slaves. They were brick makers. They were under Pharaoh's control of the beast. It's not the testimony of the Antichrist. You read and it says, point blank, get it straight, is what John was told. This is this book, the testimony of Jesus Christ, of things that are, was, and is to come. And if you read Revelation chapter 1, you know what it says? He said, behold the things that will and must come shortly. It's been over 2,000 years. You want to talk about a prophecy and a false prophecy that hasn't happened. And then it says at the end, verse 3, about the prophecy of the things that is and was and is to come, it says, and it shall happen. Well, it's sure taking 2,000 years. Man, dude, were you stoned on the island of Patmos and had a, you know, the most high was, you know, you were stoned. Can't trust your revelation, prophet John. So we got a lot of growing to do. So we, we can't, when we hear things, oh, we got to open up the book of Revelation. It sounds like the mark of the beast, the police, and everything else. And be motivated by fear. That's not the time to pull out those scriptures. Because it's not about the beast. It's not about the tribulation. It's, not a, it's about Jesus and a conquering church. I dare you to read it. 
in that context. You'll see it whole, you'll see it, you'll see it different and you won't be suckered when you go to Chuck E. Cheese and they want to put, you know, the number for your kid so they can track you. And if the kid gets lost, you don't think, oh, I can't do that. I object. Object to what? That's the market of the beast. You ain't tracking my kid. And the, the worker who makes, you know, $4 an hour is going, okay. Right? Y'all done that. That's why you're all. Okay, look at, look at Mark chapter 6. Look at verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, he saw a great multitude in a nation. And he was so moved with compassion because they were like, watch this. They were not like, you know, people who didn't have a prophet. They were like people who, did, who didn't have a teacher. He noticed there were sheep that didn't have a shepherd. If you want to know what God is thinking right now, he's coming as a shepherd. And, and it's not just the nice little shepherd, you know, who, you know, wants to just, you know, make sure your little wounds are oiled over. That's part of it. Psalm 23, he, he will lead you beside still waters when it's rough outside, when they're, when they're talking all kinds of crazy stuff, right? His rod and thy staff. What will his rod do? Well, they'll strengthen you, they'll comfort you, but they'll also protect you and they'll also discipline you. He makes you lie down. Notice that wasn't a suggestive term. He didn't say, and he suggests that you lie down in green pastures or he offers it. No, he makes you. In other words, lie down. You're restless. Come on, I have a German shepherd. One of them is restless and I have to say, lay down. And they look at me like, I have to. I can't snap. Yes. There, there it is. There's a snap. They know the snap. They know the command. They doubt, and they don't get up unless I say so. Right, Brenda? No, they really do. But the point is, they're restless, and I have to, I have to stay on it with them. Otherwise, I'd have a dog that would, would try to dominate me, and I'm not going to let a dog dominate. I'm the alpha, not them. So, I don't know what that has to do with anything, but anyway, the point is. <laughs> okay. So, I want to give you an understanding of the word compassion. The word compassion is not sympathy. It's not mercy or even pity. It's much deeper than that. So what's the difference? Mercy is this. It's like if a judge, if you're guilty of a crime and a judge says, hey, man, I'm going to give you mercy. Well, that means you would be released from your sentence by an act of mercy. You deserve to go to jail. You deserve the book to be thrown at you. But the judge's mercy steps in and says, all right, it says, oh, you never did it. You found mercy. Go your way. Compassion is if that judge who just showed mercy gets off the bench and says, hey, man, puts his arm around and says, I'm going to help you walk this out. That's action. That's compassion. It's at a whole different level. And that's what God's doing. He's not just up commanding from his throne. Mercy. No, man, he is like in the day of Acts 7 when Stephen was being, you know, stoned with rocks. They were trying to kill him. He stood up. Got his attention. When blind Bartimaeus was crying out, Lord God, have mercy, Jesus was moved with compassion. When it was, watch this, Mark chapter 6, when he saw, verse 35, that it was dark, the day was late. One translation says, man, the day was far spent. He didn't just say, hey, send him away. No, he's the judge that got off the throne or the bench and he got down where the people were and are and he does something personally supernaturally to shift everything this is what we're coming into you say well how much longer when he chooses to continue to express his compassion nothing will stop it well pastor Rank, i thought we were under judgment why do you think we're under judgment now the Bible says that God's judgments are in the earth, which they are. Men learn righteousness. So there's certain things that we've reaped that we are, uh, or that we've sown that we're now reaping. You know what I mean by that? In other words, you know, if you do certain things, you're going to reap the benefit of it. And there's a lot of sin that has been sown into the earth, into the culture, that we're reaping some of it. A lot of it is the devil. The devil is getting harsh judgments. But God is trying to show us. That, yes, he is judging principalities and powers. And, yes, he is judging those who are bent on evil and, and to do harm and to do evil works. But for those who are positioning themselves to want to do right, stand for the things that are right, there is absolute mercy and compassion. And here's what's amazing. 
Mercy and compassion, when God moves with his compassion, he lets it rain on the just and the unjust. Well, pastor, what do you mean by that? Look at Numbers chapter 21. There was a day where a, a plague broke out among Israel. And the reason a plague broke out is because they were complaining against their leader and they were complaining against God. And they became a divided people, hint, hint. And so God tells, we'll go back to Mark 6, but I want you to look at Numbers 21. So they complain to the point, and, and, and let me just say this. Remember when I told you the king remembers? How many of you have ever heard the saying that, um, you know, God keeps score? You know, we've used that flippantly. God keeps score. And we don't realize that, you know how true that is? If you look in the Old Testament, it's either in Numbers or Exodus. I think it's the book of Numbers. I think it's Numbers 10. Where they were murmuring and complaining, the people, that God, those of you that are watching, you know what he said? He said, you have complained against me these 10 times. So God was keeping score. And there are certain things that God will mark down, and he is marking down the injustice, the, the thievery, the treason. And he's marking it down. He's not letting it go. He's going to judge that. He's going to deal with it. He's going to use his compassion because God is keeping score. And in Numbers chapter 21, I want to show you this in verse 8. Uh, uh, I want you to see what happens. So they began to complain. A plague breaks out. Doesn't that sound familiar? And, and, and it says, the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent. So serpents came out and bit the people who were complaining. Remember that? And, then, and it says, I think, 32,000 people died from just the fiery serpents. And he said, Moses, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take the very thing that's attacking you, and you're going to make a snake, and you're going to put it on a pole. How many have ever seen, like, uh, the medical industry where they have the, the serpent on the pole as their, as their uh, logo? Well, where did they get that? They got it from here. They got it from God because it was a symbol of healing. Now, what they did, they made a mistake. This serpent on the pole, when they would look at it, notice this, and it came to pass that whoever would look at it shall live. Look at verse 9. And, and so we, we see Moses made a serpent on a pole, just like you see, which is symbolic of Jesus on the cross. Notice it wasn't a lamb, it was a serpent. Why was it a serpent on a pole? Because Jesus became the curse. All sin, sickness, disease, all the nasty stuff that the serpent was doing and does came on Jesus. He paid the ultimate price Amen. for your healing, your deliverance, your soundness of mind. Come on, your rescue, your protection, your direction if you need it. And so anyone that would look at the cross or the serpent on the pole or Jesus who became, as it said in Galatians 3, cursed is any man who hangs on the tree. Then it goes on and says, cursed was Jesus who hung on that tree. So that's what you're seeing, an Old Testament example of Jesus becoming sin, the curse. Are you hearing me? So ultimately we could be free, healed, forgiven. And so anybody that looked at this serpent on the pole would be healed. And you say, Pastor, why are you saying this? I'm going to say it for a couple reasons. Number one is what the serpent was up to in the midst of a plague, God re focused the whole nation. Right now, the enemy is trying to get us to focus on a virus. He's trying to get us to focus on a vaccination and boosters and all kinds of stuff that does in the whole scheme of things. How many watched Flashpoint last night? And you had the doctor on. That was not good. Did you see that? Not the doctor that was talking sense. I'm talking about the, the other doctor, Dr. Fauci. And he was his little snicker. And it reminded me, I thought about Eve, you know, standing there, you know, as the snake's telling him, go ahead, eat. You won't die. Your safety is in my hands. That's exactly how that snaky, slithery feeling feels. And the snake is up to a lot of harm right now. But where is this all coming? 
What the snake, what the devil has meant for harm. Come on, those snakes that attack the people in the midst of a plague. Numbers 21. God's going to refocus it. And it's going to become not sickness, disease, division. It's going to, be a, it's going to become a symbol of what's going to unite us and heal us as a people and as a nation. Why? Because the enemy only attacks what he's afraid of. He's afraid of a healing movement. That's already in process and is only going to escalate. That will, it doesn't matter because God's being moved with his compassion. It doesn't matter if you've been vaccinated or unvaccinated. God's going to move with his compassion and it's going to be whatever the serpent tried. If he did put something in the vaccination or if he didn't put something in the vaccination or if he's behind the, the, the virus or if he's not behind the virus, if the devil is involved somewhere, the focus is going to come back to Jesus is going to break its power and it's going to release healing that is going to bring a unity among the people among the nations and it's going to expose the devil and break its power that's what you read in numbers chapter 28 the serpent tried during a plague and god said all right i'm going to refocus them the attention is going to be upon me i'm the one with my healing power that's going to break the power of the snake are you here and, and, and you say, well, where, what, what, well, what is that? That's called the Lord's compassion. He's come off the bench of the mercy seat, and he's putting his arm around, and he's saying, look, I'm realizing how this is dividing you. I'm realizing how harsh this is and how unjust it's been and how unfair it's been when you've had mandates and bosses and people trying to take away your freedoms and scaring you and threatening you. And making you do things against your will. And more than that, your, your, your body is, is, is my temple. And God is coming with his compassion to take that serpent. He's going to pay for it. God's going to kick his butt. And it's going, to become an, it's going to become a healing movement. You watch. All right, look at Mark 6. Let's go back to Mark 6, verse 34. Did you all get that? Okay, I'm almost going to let you go here. We just got like two more hours, man. That's it. It's done. Bring it on. Everybody else is in agreement with that. They're like, no, don't bring it on. Are you kidding me? I got stuff to do. Okay, look at Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Jesus saw a great multitude move with compassion because they were like sheep that didn't have a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Now watch the condition. Watch the condition. Watch the condition. By this time it was late in the day. How many ever felt that way? You that are watching, oh, it's just too late. That's why the beast is here and the Antichrist. Listen, it's been here for, they tried to label all the other guys ahead of them. The one that we currently have now in the fake administration. They, they tried to label them all. That's the Antichrist. That's the beast. No, they all act like him. But here's the point. People say it's too late. I've had people write me, oh, it's too late. Oh, it's too late. Well, since when are you God? And since when have you been positioned by positional authority and grace by Jesus, the Lord of the church, to determine that? That's why he has prophets. That's why he has certain vessels that he positions. He anoints. He appoints. He gives them grace. That they hear. They receive commands, instructions, and they're an echo. It's not a status to have a prophetic calling or office or title. It's an assignment. You're a speaker repeating what God says. So who told you that it's too late? Well, but if you read Revelation chapter 7, listen, they've been using that same scripture for probably 2,000 years. 